So uh, thanks very much, Bobby, for those uh, kind words. It's a real uh, privilege and pleasure for me to be here today to uh, share with you some of the work that I'm doing uh, together with uh, my colleague Kevin Stanley at the University of Saskatchewan. This work focuses on um, seeking to synergize the benefits we derive from two exciting areas of uh, uh, recent uh, research advances uh, that are germane to uh, the, uh, the health enterprise. And that concerns um, the use of uh, ubiquitous, portable, wireless sensor systems on the one hand, and a variety of types of systems models on the other, exactly the sort of systems models we're learning about here at ISSA. And uh, within the uh, span of today's session, I'm going to uh, try to give you a glimpse of some of the motivations for, uh, for combining these two, two very powerful approaches on their own. Some uh, reasons for thinking that the uh, insights that we can derive from combining them together go well beyond what we can derive from any one in isolation. The whole is truly greater than the sum of its parts here. I'm going to be uh, introducing just to, to make things concrete when I talk about sense data. You can be introducing a, a sensor platform that we've used to good effect for collecting um, data to, to inform our understanding of, of health related patterns. We're going to be talking about um, uh, some concrete ways in which models can be combined with sensor data, giving some broad introductions for it, and then talk about three vignettes. Um, vignettes that demonstrate how sense data can be combined with each of the sorts of modeling techniques that are being discussed here at ISSH. So with image-based modeling, with system dynamics modeling, and with social network analysis. And uh, very importantly, trying to highlight why each of these types of system science modeling affords us substantial advantage, unique advantage, when it comes to combining with sensor data. Data that, uh, advantages that can't be replicated by combinations with the other techniques. And finally, I'll be making some uh, concluding remarks. So the general motivations for this work lie in, in four general types of observations. The first of the observations became clear to me uh, two decades back when I first started working with sy system science models for decision-making purposes. And that is that um, for many, not all, but many types of questions, these models exert a, a gluttonous appetite for data. There's many insights they can provide um, with uh, stylized models, but for, for many uses of these models, we, we need to feed them, to, to parameterize them, to structure them, to calibrate them to substantial amounts of data. If you're building social network analysis models, this may be data related to interactions of people, the relationships to one another or the relationships of people to organizations, relationships of people to places. If we're building a, a dynamic model, a, a simulation model, uh, such as we're learning about the agent-based or system dynamics track, this includes provision of data that might help us estimate particular model parameters or against which we may check model output in order to arrive at, at confidence in that model. In any case, uh, models uh, benefit from the availability less obvious is that interpretation of gaining insight from this data can be strongly aided and in some cases almost required the presence of models of one sort or another. So selection of the data to collect, the throttling, the, the frequency, the sampling that we do, um, that we wish to use for different types of data, say in an automated context, the fusion of different data elements which each speak to some degree about some underlying situation. We're trying to make sense from them together. The filtering of that data, um, placing less weight on things that we think are less reliable, for example. And the interpretation of that data in terms of what it tells us about what things are going on out there in the world. All of these tasks are, if not impossible, very, very difficult to, to attain without models. And they might involve a lot of assumptions. The models aid us greatly in, in uh, securing value from our data. A third observation is, is a comment on the state of, of today's technology landscape. And that is that risk sensor platforms are increasingly surrounded, surrounding us. 
whether you're in your car, whether you're carrying a cell phone, a PDA, a laptop, um, we are surrounded increasingly by devices that sense the world around us. And most of them do that for very operational reasons. They make it convenient for us to interact with these devices. You rotate the screen of your iPad and the text adjusts accordingly. So you can go from reading it in, in uh, portrait to landscape mode. You can be assisted greatly by a variety of sensors, uh, sensor proximity to your face, for example, and how it uh, engages with you. And that makes these devices that much more usable. However, this sort of, uh, these sort of sensors can be repurposed with a little or no impact on their original function to gain insight into uh, health-related issues in the external world. And moreover, this sort of sensor data can be cross-linked. If we have a single device or a set of peered devices that are collecting uh, several types of data, we can timestamp it and, and capture the fact that this data was captured at the same time in the same context and the value of that cross-linking goes well beyond the sum of the value of each sensor would, would offer in isolation. Finally, we're immersed in, as I speak, a growing cacophony of wireless communication signals. These are signals that your cell phone relies upon to make a call, GPRS or GSM. They're signals that you use to browse web pages with Wi-Fi. They're used to play music to your headset with Bluetooth. They're used to communicate with printers, devices around us. They're used to recognize the goods for which we're shopping and so we could replenish items on store shelves with RFID. And these things are ubiquitous. We see these signals everywhere. Now, this affords us two strong advantages when it comes to sensors. First of all, it means that we can untether the participants uh, within our study, that when we collect information related to people's behavioral patterns, we can do so in a less um, obtrusive fashion. We can upload that data very readily. But perhaps less obviously, it also, the, the presence of these signals tells us a tremendous amount about the world that surrounds us. And we'll get a glimpse of that. Turns out that they can be repurposed, just as sensors can, to provide us great insight into our environment and uh, risks that may, may be appendant upon that. So I, I talked a little bit about motivations. I'd like to give you a concrete sense of what I, one of the things I mean when I talk about sensors. We're going to introduce our, our second generation sensor system that we built at the University of Saskatchewan, uh, the IFE platform. And um, this platform, unless, uh, unlike its first generation counterpart, is built around smartphones. And we do this for very particular reasons. And these reasons broadly reflect the amazing devices that the smartphones are. The fact that uh, smartphones uh, can provide tremendous degree of usability in common day-to-day -day functions, permitting us to take pictures, record lectures, track the path of our morning run, um, seamlessly connect to different networks, fail over when we're using Skype to, uh, to a 3G network from a Wi-Fi network when we go out of range. These things are, are remarkable make them very, very responsive devices. But one of the keys that makes them so responsive is the presence of an amazing variety of sensors that are commonly available on these devices. Now the, the fact that these sensors are built into these devices affords us a tremendous opportunity because it can allow us to repurpose them to gain insights into health. So we built a platform on uh, applying the, the best-selling And uh, we particularly have uh, built atop the, uh, the Android platform, which is the so-called operating system that helps the device um, manage all its functions. Um, this platform can sense multiple sensor modalities, and we'll, we'll talk specifics about this. And it runs by <coughs> collecting bursts of data. Uh, because of uh, battery lifetime issues, um, we can't have it running full out tilt at all times. So it, it wakes up periodically, and how frequently is up to the research. It could be every minute, it could be every three minutes, it could be every five minutes. It could be in a customized schedule depending upon other events that are observed. 
to measure things for different sensors. And at the same time, it's a richly functional smartphone, which is a non-trivial issue, uh, which is a, a great uh, advantage, one of the major reasons we went to smartphones. Because, because it is such an attractive device, because it's a, a device which offers compelling functionality, whether it's browsing the web, uh, speaking on Skype, watching YouTube videos, uh, checking out the calendar, what have you, um, these devices are desirable for people to carry with them, to keep with them, to keep charged. Hence, the need for external incentives is less, and the internal incentives um, uh, provide a natural degree of compliance. So um, these are devices that, that we're carrying. Provide us insight into a variety of factors that, that can help shed light on, on health related issues. Um, people's location, uh, physical activity level, spatial proximity to one another, social context, communication, and the list goes on. And this, the fact that we can tap into these, um, uh, these different issues of, of interest for our modeling and more generally for, for understanding um, health behavior is a testament to just the number of, of devices that are packed and to their ability to be used for several purposes, single sensors multiply deployed. So for example, with our camera, we can establish, it may not be obvious, but, but location, the presence of, of uh, pets and pollution markers. We can uh, take, get estimates of portion size for meals that we're eating um, through accelerometers used for prosaic needs such as rotating the, the text on the device, we can gain understanding of activity levels. Uh, GPS gives us a sense of uh, location outdoors and can be used as a sensor to determine whether we are outdoors or whether we're indoors. Communications uh, uh, mechanisms within these phones can allow us to tap into a variety of, of databases that may shape how quickly we wish to collect data the particular types of data that we are collecting. So for example, databases on the current weather that's being experienced. Um, tap into uh, databases that may relate to, say, uh, occurrence of flu in the area, from something like Google's Flu Watch. We can get a sense of uh, what's going on in the environment through use of the microphone. We can also record things. Through Wi-Fi, we can upload data to, to services in the cloud to do very, very rapid computations, which would otherwise be prohibitive on the device itself. We can issue surveys on this device, either pre-planned surveys or customized surveys to the current situation. We can measure communication behavior. How are people using the device? Who are they calling? What are they watching on YouTube? Where are they browsing to? What sort of health health related data might they be uh, be seeing that may shape their sense of, of risks or shape their sense of uh, um, in health decision making? Uh, we can capture aspects of their schedule and contacts between people. So within this platform, which we've designed to be uh, very general purpose uh, to allow us to be easily outfitted for very different tasks rather than hard coded to, to plan on certain tasks. We support a variety of different uh, sensor devices, uh, sensor modalities. So for example, GPS. Um, this, this small video shows um, collection of GPS data. These are if locations are indicated with these Chevron fields. And what we're doing is we're following a certain participant carrying his smartphone on their way home from work, late one spring afternoon in sunny Texas, again. And you'll notice that there are these Chevrons scattered around, some of them even out here. <coughs> indication of the fact that data, like models, does not come from heaven. Even though it may be from satellites, it's imperfect. <coughs> Following this person, but there's bicker around their actual location. Data is imperfect, and to address some of those difficulties, we need models. They're going along in their car at a faster rate now, and it imputes them being at a location um, some distance, but that correctly surmises they're now at a location which turns out to be a Sobeys grocery and they're entering Sobeys to do some, some afternoon shopping. After some time in the grocery store, during much of which the, the signal is uh, occluded, there's only occasional signals escaping, they'll come back to their vehicle and, um, and then take off again. You'll notice that uh, the paths they take is not continuous, it's episodic. 
we collect information periodically. We wake up and get a birth certificate. And that's if they're home, where they spend the remainder of the day, although from a CPS perspective, it thinks they're merely in the area. So it's an indication of, of uh, the sort of uh, degree of detail we can get through, through GPS. Another uh, technology we can tap into is Bluetooth. Now, Bluetooth, you may know, as a protocol to allow you to use uh, headsets to listen to your music. You may know it as a protocol to send, to send data between devices, such as to a printer from your, from your laptop or from your um, cell phone. Well, it turns out it can be used for many purposes. And we've used it to assess uh, proximity, to allow us to understand people's location. And uh, when I talked about a, a capacity of signals, this is one indication of it. So participants in our study over the course of, of one month, this is a study we ran about two months ago, um, the average participant went through an average of something, a pass by an average of something like 20 distinct Bluetooth devices per day. It detected their, um, the proximity to those people. Some went by many more than that, some went by quite a bit less. And the degree, the level of context that, um, that uh, in the state of conference during uh, the course of the day varies significantly. So um, reflecting the composition of our study population in this case, which was drawn from students, staff, um, at our university, uh, we see that uh, most of these contacts with um, other Bluetooth devices, which could include other participants in the study, could include people, people on the bus who happen to be nearby and carrying a Bluetooth cell phone. It could include uh, computers in their environment, et cetera. Most of those contacts occurred over the course of the day with a long tail, since with late student hours and computer science department probably, and uh, a decrease in early morning as people were slumbering. Now, if we graph these um, contact patterns out, in this case, over the course of the day, we can separate uh, participants in this study. This is a very small study. You can see them in red here. And other Bluetooth devices that they encountered. Um, many of these devices were encountered by more than one uh, participant in the study and are thus located between them. Some of them were only encountered by a single single individual. Again, these Bluetooth devices could be of various sorts. And if we look at them over the course of a week, we see uh, these participants encountered a really massive number of devices in a small, Midwestern, quiet Canadian city. You can only imagine what this would look like in New York City. Um, if we, we could actually, for Bluetooth, we can distinguish between level of proximity by the signal strength of Bluetooth we can distinguish between contacts that are nearby, those that are further away, and further away yet. Say those who are just a few meters away, within sneezing distance, so to speak. Those who are uh, further away, but uh, you could easily carry on a conversation with, and those who are, are really across the room. And if we uh, were to prune this to look at only close contacts, we see that uh, we still have a fair number. We could further subdivide these um, according to whether they're stationary or not. Are they things like printers, desktops, et cetera, which are unlikely to be moving about? Or are they mobile devices? Other people's cell phones, other people's laptops, well, not laptops, excuse me, cell phones, um, PDAs, et cetera. And we see actually there's quite a lot of mobile devices with whom these participants have contact. These may be third parties who uh, different participants encounter at different times in the downtown area of the city or around the university. Um, and if you start looking over the course of the, the study, what we find is a lot of these mobile devices, which may belong to people who know nothing about the study, um, are actually encountered many times by the participants. There's many fewer of these outliers once you look at the study as a whole. And many of these devices are encountered multiple times by the participants who are serving as rooms so people are encountering these external parties again and again and again. And we can look at uh, patterns as to where those uh, contacts occur, under what uh, capacity they occur. So we can look at signal strength to get a sense of distance. And we can look at uh, the contacts of a given participant with different particular devices. Another sensor modality we can make use of is, is Wi-Fi. Now, Wi-Fi is a, is a protocol that uh, I'm sure everyone in here has used at one point or another to go browsing, to check your email, et cetera. It's a common wireless protocol that's used for, for um, uh, most uh, wireless networking from your laptop. 
What's less obvious is that this can be used as a location marker. The, the fact that we are seeing certain Wi-Fi hotspots at a given time gives great clues as to where we're located. But even more significantly, the strength of the signals from those locations, from those hotspots, can even localize us more specifically as to where we are. And uh, my colleague Kevin Stanley, who's the uh, co-creator the, uh, co of this presentation, um, makes, uh, is one of the innovators in terms of trilateralization systems. Turning with Wi-Fi networks, we see into an estimated location within a facility. This is important because GPS, standard GPS relying on satellites only works if you can see satellites. If you're in an indoor room, um, don't have uh, windows to the outside world, it's unlikely to work. And, and uh, Wi-Fi can provide us a lot of understanding as to where we are. Bluetooth, uh, equally much so. And uh, Wi-Fi is all around us. So in the course of our one month study, the various participants in our study ran into 19,000 different Wi-Fi devices and uh, just short of, of 10,000 different Bluetooth devices. And we can use this, this sort of information to arrive at position estimates for people, <coughs> uh, more broadly for Wi-Fi at the sub-meter level resolution for Bluetooth. So we can locate people, we can place them indoors or outdoors using either GPS, Wi-Fi, or, or Bluetooth. Finally, we can collect uh, rich accelerometer data from the built-in accelerometers of the phone. Uh, here it is graphed out by our hour of the day, again showing um, important cycles. Finally, um, there's survey data that we can collect, custom surveys that can be issued to people on cell phones to ask them to disambiguate um, what's going on, to, to sense their affect, um, to understand, uh, to understand generally their context. Now, each of these types of sensors in isolation is intriguing and offers intriguing possibilities. Um, possibilities that could shed significant light into movement patterns, into contacts between individuals, into physical activity um, over time, in a very attractive packet, one that people are incentivized. However, it's really the cross-linking of these different sensors where we secure the biggest value. And uh, once you start putting multiple sensors together, sensors for the same participant for the same uh, points in time, you can gain uh, significant additional insights. So for example, uh, combining together accelerometer data with GPS and with Bluetooth, we can understand how physical activity levels change near parks. Right? Um, how does it change based on um, the, uh, the reported um, incidents of, of criminal behavior in a given area? How, does this, how do these uh, levels of physical activity change in the presence of other people? And based on the levels of physical activity those other people are engaging in, how does it change based on weather? We can gain a sense through combining other, other uh, types of modalities for estimates of contact location, understanding of social context. <coughs> For, for activity that's observed, et cetera. So there's a tremendous potential for convergence, not only by looking at these in isolation, but looking at several together, particularly when you consider that we can do more or less free from the point of view and inobtrusively from the point of view of the person with the cell phone, tremendous calculations, calculations for inferencing, et cetera, the, the possibility re really opens up. An example here is the importance of flight. You combine just about any other sensor modality from devices with flight and you can gain extra insights. Incorporating an understanding of place can give us a sense of the transmission of norms. Um, are people in the same location? Sandy Pentland's work has shown that FaceTime between people, so-called so F2F, for those who have seen the video, which I strongly recommend, can shape people's behavior in ways that other types of communication just can't seem to. And uh, knowing that, that people are located in the same same place can be can give us sub substantial insights into that. Um, we can gain insights into how why we see the contact patterns measured through Bluetooth. What sort of mobility patterns are giving rise to them? Because contacts, the fact that two people have are in pro close proximity, is a reflection of their movement over a landscape. And we can come to understand uh, their mobility and some of the drivers for those mobility patterns, which could allow us to better understand how contacts are likely to evolve in different context or if we change certain factors, such as aspects of the built environment. Um, 
understanding a place may allow us to understand resources that could be exploited through visitors, the status of the users. Um, close colleague of mine, Basad al Adem, found tremendous insights gained from combining social network analysis with, with place data, a concept that some of you here may be familiar with, um, because it would allow you to understand different types of individuals by access to different, um, to different resources. So uh, impacts of the environment um, on risks and on behavior uh, can also be significant. So um, for example, if we're looking at people's movement within a healthcare facility, say a long-term care facility on the one hand or a hospital on the other, um, uh, if we're interested in risks of nosocomial infections, knowing where people are having their contacts or spending their time can give us sense of risks uh, associated with that, such as surface accumulation of bugs like MRSA. The environment um, can also give us a sense of the character or capacity of interaction. For example, you pick two known individuals, say a, a, a professor on the one hand and a student on the other. Our understanding of the nature of their a given interaction, a given pattern of contact, their close proximity to each other, our interpretation of that would be quite different if I were to tell you that that contact is taking place on the one hand in the lecture hall, and the next on the other hand in the professor's office, another hand in a sports stadium, and on the other hand at a restaurant. Our understanding of the ways in which that, that contact might, might be relevant um, for the purposes of, of our study could change uh, significantly. So place is something that can add a lot of value when combined with other sorts of data. And we've looked at using place um, as a way of mark, uh, mapping out, for example, activity levels. Um, in this case, what we've shown is, is mapping out contacts between participants. Where are the contacts between people taking place within our city? And uh, we, we can map out uh, people's um, locations at the time contacts occur and highlight those places where significant numbers of contacts are occurring, whether they be restaurants, homes, uh, laboratories, etc., in quite some level of detail. Now, leveraging this data, there's a variety of types of questions that could be answered. Um, I've alluded to some of them. For example, how do physical activity levels <coughs> vary by proximity to amenities such as parks or by social context or neighborhood safety? Which grocery stores should participants visit? How often and how do they get there? Is it with, uh, by walking? Is it with cars? Um, is it in the context of other people? Um, how much time do particularly family members spend together? How quickly does uh, physical activity in kids change based on changes in physical activity in adults? We're interested in looking at uh, a study going on in New York City now and, and uh, working towards setting up uh, the arrangements for it logistically, which is looking at a program a little bit like moving to opportunity in the US, where individuals are moved from one neighbor to a, to a, a poor neighborhood to a mixed neighborhood. And some people um, are moved from that same neighborhood to that, to that same facility. And one of the big questions people are interested in for that study is how do the socialization mobility patterns for those people, either from the neighborhood originally or moved there, um, to what degree do they differ? How long do they differ? In what ways do they differ? Because with moving to opportunity, there was a lot of questions about the ways in which the, um, the particulars of whether someone moved might have uh, provided additional artifacts into uh, into the data beyond the issue of the particular environment, the character of the environment in which they were living. So there's a variety of questions that we can gain insight into at the epidemiological level and at the health services delivery level if we're interested in, in the cooperation of, of individuals within the in a long-term care facility, uh, where nurses are spending their time. In, in our city, there's a big shift towards um, the program known as uh, releasing time to care, seeking to free up nurse time to spend it with patients. And they're interested in using these devices to try to gain an understanding of where the nurses are spending their time right now to, to gain insight together with models as to how that might change if we could change some aspects of the protocol. Is time being taken for hand washing? Where are nurses kept waiting? What sets of staff, in fact, do meet most, most frequently and might, might need to be have the um, arrangements rearranged so that they can be, that can be facilitated? 
We have a set of uh, questions we can answer now, but there's a set of extensions that we're very interested in. And some of them are custom surveys, surveys that could ask questions that are contextually relevant to collect information germane for interpreting the data that's already been collected via the sensors. Um, uh, data that could help disambiguate behavior patterns. For, for example, if we see an individual in the study um, going outside and coming back after a short time, were they, were they outside to smoke? Give, a, give some sense of, uh, of their behavior uh, over time. So custom surveys are, are a significant interest, calling behavior of people. I'd like to provide a more uh, flexible interface, among other things, to collect information from other Bluetooth devices. Turns out that Bluetooth, in addition to allowing location, sensing contact, it's a great tool for picking up other types of sensors that aren't built into this device. We make use of commodity devices because we can ride the commodity price curve. The devices um, that are used here are off-the-shelf devices that we can purchase at cheaper and cheaper prices as time goes on. Um, However, there are needs sometimes for other types of custom sensors. So if you want to get a sense of people's patterns of weight change over time, perhaps coupling it with a model of um, human metabolism and body composition, for example, we might want to get periodic readings on people's weight. And we could do that from a Bluetooth scale, which are readily available out there in the market. If we want to get respiration and pulse sensors to get a sense of heart rate or, or respiration rate, we can do that readily through Bluetooth sensors. Same with galvanic skin response to give a sense of arousal, uh, for example, um, which can give us insights into whole new areas of, of, of uh, relevance to health. So I've given a glimpse of the sensor platform we're working with and the sort of data that we can collect from it. And for those who haven't uh, seen it, I strongly recommend that you take a look at Sandy Pentland's talk for how that sort of data that's collected by devices like this can be cross-linked with data collected in quite different avenues, point of sale data, for example, um, from stores, and combined together to yield uh, health insight. And Sandy has some wonderful material in there on data mining from this sort of data. But our, our purposes today are a little bit different. We're going to be looking at how this sort of data can be synergized with, with models, the sort of models complex systems models that you're talking about here at ISSH. And the motivations for this work reflect the fact that even the richest sensor data, even if we could put aside battery limitations and open up the sky to all sorts of sensors that we can collect, that data by itself, left to its own devices, it offers somewhat limited insight. It has limited generalizability. You go from a, a pattern of someone's um, locations where someone traveled in the course of a day, you'd like to go to something higher level than that, to, to generalize from that to uh, a general sort of mobility model for that individual, showing where and what days of the week or what times of the day they travel between places. Data by itself has unclear implications for decision making. If there's one thing that the web has taught us um, on, uh, about, about the nature of us as humans, it's that more data doesn't indicate better decision making. Right? And so it's true with sensor data. We, we'd like something that links up sense data to, to the choices we need to make so we could tell its relevance, its implications for our choices. Often, all, even with the most um, frequently sensed data, what happens in between the sensor measurements is not always clear, whether they're separated in space or in, in, in time. And noisy data obscures the analysis. We saw that with that, those scattered chevrons on that GPS video I showed earlier. At the same time, models that you're talking about here at ISSH have, have significant limitations as well. I, I mentioned the certain litany questions of gluttonous need for, for data. Um, there's also, more deeply though, there's a certain fragility often, a certain brittleness associated with these models in terms of the assumptions upon which they rely. Um, for example, if we're building a simulation model, which I spend much of my time doing, um, there's likely to be a bunch of factors. No matter how detailed that model, it, it, it has to, by the nature of it, omit a tremendous amount of detail about the world, factors that lie outside the scope of the model. Uh, and those exogenous factors, we need to often make assumptions about them as I go into the model. 
Um, for example, in, or we spend um, a fair bit of effort these days building um, models related to West Nile, which is um, a, a significant concern in the, the Canadian prairie. And um, these models seek to help us understand the trade-off between interventions related to West Nile. These interventions include things such as um, uh, advisories, um, down the road vaccination, but also things like larva siding and engulfment siding to cut down the mosquito population. Now, how effective those interventions are depends. It depends a lot on the weather that's going to be experienced. And we can have the best, most detailed model showing the vagaries of mosquito mating and landing to lay their eggs. And indeed, there's, there's agent-based models out there that do exactly that for the, for the sake of understanding malaria patterns. But if our assumptions about the weather are correct, these endogenous factors, we're never going to have an endogenized weather model for, for our entire area that's going to allow us to predict the weather exactly. And our model's going to be, for its estimates of the trade-off between interventions, predicated on, on certain assumptions about the weather. There are systematic errors that will creep into our model. With even the best of data that we may have access to, we may misestimate parameters, and we may omit certain factors that are relevant structurally to the model. And in even the best of models, there's a risk of rapid obsolescence, of divergence, of even the most detailed model from what actually happened because of these uh, reasons here. And finally, we can have overconfidence in it. I made the comment one time to my colleague Kevin Stanley shortly after we had initiated our work together, our collaboration, that we modelers are all too often like data bubbles. I feel like, like a, a scavenger sometimes. Looking, I fly high, high, high with lofty goals, pristine ideas for my model, really, really rich mathematical understanding of why I formulated a different way. But all too often, I is the data buzzard. <laughs> and that was Kevin's annotation uh, there. Um, he surprised me with this at, a, at another conference. <laughs> discriminating and unseemly choices of, of you know, so we fly, fly high with lofty expectations, pristine mathematical understanding, and we eat low, low, low. <laughs> we, we eat, um, we eat uh, the equivalent of, of carrion um, for data because data is not available for our epidemiological context or in recent, recent years, and we may sort of uh, suck it up and apply data from previous years, or we may collect data from other jurisdictions that we believe are somewhat comparable. We may we compromise a lot with our data because we don't have many choices. And this is something that afflicts models. So I had a desire to move beyond buzzardhood, um, to move beyond being purely a scavenger, and to make some inroads so that we could try to collect uh, rich data that can inform the sort of models we build, whether it's models of human metabolism, models related to uh, risk factors for obesity and, and uh, type 2 diabetes. I, I was hoping to collect a richer, richer sense of data. And I believe there's a natural synergy here. Sensor data provides us with a rich grounding in observations. Um, uh, and this can provide fantastic databases for model parameterization and calibration for, for simulation models or for reconstructing <coughs> fundamental structural features such as, as networks within um, social network analysis models. And uh, this sort of data, if we, if we uh, do data mining, it can stimulate dynamic hypotheses um, that, can, that can be captured in models. On the other hand, um, dynamic models, uh, provide an extremely important complement to sensor data by helping us fill the gaps between sensor, sensor data. Often we can only sense an impoverished subset of the factors out there that would need to be incorporated within our model. We can only measure things of certain types. And in our dynamic model, which is characterizing um, the underlying drivers for the situation we see, may may have a component that's measurable, but lots of components that aren't directly observable. Dynamic models can capture regularities that we hypothesize to underlie the sensor data. It can allow us to filter noisy sensor data, to arrive at sort of consensus estimates which combine together measured data and model predictions. 
uh, dynamic models can allow us to try to generalize observed behavioral patterns, to go from scatterings of data to try to understand the underlying structure that, that is, is kept day after day uh, associated with an individual's patterns, for example. Models can inform adaptive sampling, how frequently we should sample, and put a priority on different types of sampling. And that could then allow us to, to understand the proximal and distal implications of behavior. So I'd like to replace this sort of existence <laughs> with this sort of existence or that sort of existence. Um, a, a set of, uh, a whole pack of wolves to chase down fresh new data to incorporate in my model. Now, the, the truth of the matter is that we can use these um, sort of uh, synergies between on the one hand uh, data and the other hand uh, models, the sensor data and the other hand models, with many types of models. And I've listed uh, three here today that are particularly germane because they're the types that are covered in ISS-8. And I'm going to be going through a set of vignettes on applying each of these sort of, of, of techniques together with models. Now, because I'm trying to cover all three, I'm, I, I apologize, I'm going to have to go quite quickly through this. And there's substantive ideas that come up with each of these. And I would welcome questions. I'll try to leave time for, for a good set of time for questions at the end of this and one-on-one -on -one questions as well. So we'll be going through a set of vignettes um, and we're going to begin with an application of uh, agent-based models and this relates to our flu net study um, which was a small study conducted in a pandemic flu season in 2009 with a, set, a small set of 36 participants together with um, uh, markers for nine locations. Actually, um, something we conducted with the previous generation of sensor systems that I don't have time to go into the details of it. And that sensor system could record the proximity of individuals to each other and to these fixed locations, which are common sort of uh, locations for, for people within the study to visit. And we cross link this data with health survey data. So we, on a weekly basis, as well as at the beginning and the end of the study, we ask people um, a set of uh, basic questions about their health status. And most importantly, during the study, this included questions on um, symptoms uh, related to influenza-like illness. So uh, coughs, sneezes, uh, fevers, et cetera. Um, but also included basic demographics, uh, vaccination history, that sort of thing. And we ran this for 13 weeks during the 2009 pandemic flu season. So just over three months. And uh, for each participant in the study, we had information collected on 30 second intervals throughout the duration of the study. So about 262,000 30 second data points, add them up and you'll get 13 weeks. And we had that for each individual within the study. And um, many of the patterns that came out of the study were largely confirmatory. For example, contacts, day to day, similar information that was collected, I uh, showed you earlier during our, uh, for our more recent study. And, um, shows a, a contact graph of people's contacts with one another, but highly aggregated. And what's actually going on here is a, uh, a much more detailed level of contacts that we'll see about in a few minutes, uh, a very dynamic situation. We could look at uh, contact duration. So when two people contact each other, how often, sort of how long do they stay together? Well, it turns out there's a whole, this is a, a cumulative um, distribution function. And so Almost all contacts lasted at least uh, at least a minute here, but if you go up from one minute, ten minutes to a hundred minutes, getting into the hours range, the fraction of contacts, and over here on the, the y-axis, a uh, fraction of, of, of all contacts that lasted longer than that falls, and uh, we could quantify that uh, quite quite precisely. We also found huge diversity in the level of contacts encountered by different people in the study. Some individuals, this is a story about contact location, had tremendous numbers of contacts compared to other individuals. So there's different degrees of mixing. Some of our fix up people, um, fix it up people in our computer science department, you know, computer scientists run into technical problems too, you know, um, on their computers and <laughs> sometimes we need someone to come in and, you know, uh, figure out why our network's not working or what have you. And, um, those people would circulate a lot and might have greater numbers of contacts. Other individuals working in basement labs might, might have fewer. So here's some um, uh, highly aggregated data. This is actually not from exactly this context, but it's highly representative. 
So what we see here is a ring of participants and a connection between or, uh, any two um, points in that ring indicates a contact um, between those people registered during this time. I can't remember off the top of my head whether these were only close contacts or all contacts. And what we see is that these patterns of contacts are not random. There's long periods of time with no contact, three nights, um, and then there's periods of time of lots and lots of contacts between individuals. These contacts are not random in terms of their uh, uh, topological uh, occurrence either. Lots, certain people have lots of contacts with each other. Other pairs of people have very little contact. So this is aggregated data. Remember, for this study, we were collecting on 30-second intervals. And uh, this data here is aggregated up so we connect people if there's any contact between them in the course of an hour, just so we have a, a shorter movement. If you were to play the actual video from the study, you'd see um, the, uh, the holidays, the, the vacation there come and go, um, people's behavior um, throughout different, um, different periods of the year. But we took this data, that data you just saw of these contact patterns, highly dynamic and we combined it with a model. The model itself was a transmission model for H1N1 that was drawn from um, a highly regarded paper in the literature by colleagues of mine at the University of Toronto. So this is a paper by Fisman, Tuet, and others for those who follow this area. It was a, um, uh, they had a uh, disease transmission model that involved people progressed in the normal set of states. So they started susceptible, they got infected, um, they could become latently They then went through a phase where they were asymptomatically infectious, so they were shedding virus around them, but they weren't yet symptomatic. It's one of the most dangerous phases because they can spread it, but they don't know they're sick. They then proceeded to a phase of symptomatic infectiousness and then to a phase where they're still miserable with, with sneezing and coughing, but they're not infectious and then back to a recovered state. So we had this model for each individual within the population. That matched the study participant subgroup. Each individual is matched to, to an agent. And these individuals would be connected in periodic to try exactly that data we just, uh, uh, that, that was collected by the study, similar to what we just saw play. So we took this agent based model, incorporated here, it linked it up with its data, and it played again and again, like, like Groundhog Day. People went through the same set of contacts every day. For those of you who have seen that, we also linked up some population data related to exogenous infection pressure, infection pressure from outside the sur survey population. And there was uncertainty from this model. As, a, as an agent-based model, including progression among states, if someone was exposed to, uh, an, a susceptible individual was exposed to an infectious individual, they wouldn't always automatically contract flu. In fact, there was a certain chance that they would. And uh, sometimes, for some simulations, they wouldn't, for some they did. Because of these stochastic uncertainties, this variability of who gets the infection from outside the population, from other infected people within the population, we ran the, the simulation many times. For those of you who have seen this in the tracks, this is what's called a Monte Carlo analysis. And it's kind of like Groundhog Day, for those of you who have seen that movie. So in the movie, Bill Murray um, is subjected to the same external sequence of events day after day after day. He keeps on waking up and he's surrounded by celebration of Groundhog Day with Puxatawney Phil and, and uh, others around him, reporters, etc. cetera. And uh, the thing that varies there is his behavior. The thing that varies here is the, the vagaries of who happens to get infected. So we played Groundhog Day 100,000 times each for the baseline realization, ran on a cluster of computers. In alternative scenarios, we evaluated with different assumptions about parameter value 2,500 times each. So Groundhog Day many times over. We'd be really sick after 100,000 times. Um, okay, uh, we then performed a set of sensitivity analyses with different uh, assumptions about vaccination. Do we have vaccination or not? Uh, the closest of proximity required to transmit. We could, again, distinguish people's contacts. And we examined that with or without behavioral removal. In other words, do people... Once they know they're symptomatic, do they remove themselves uh, from the population? And uh, time is too short to allow me to go into this because I have to cover my, uh, my other two vignettes. But suffice it to say that the results are very consistent with what was actually observed from the survey data we got back from participants. Um, 
we saw significant effects of vaccination. But what was most significant was kind of a, a somewhat of a surprise to us is, given the actual patterns we see in human contact patterns, what best explains someone's vulnerability to getting infected over all these different Groundhog Day so-called realizations? If we looked at their chance of being infected and how it varied with different factors, the biggest factor was not how many different people they saw. It wasn't their between-the-stem travel, to what degree they were sort of on a thoroughfare from one set of people to another, which is a very attractive uh, a hypothesis. And we said, oh, it contributed some. Um, but instead, it was something that took into account their total contact with anyone. So um, not, not, not distinguishing whether it's with the same people or different people, that really best explained the chance of infection within this context. And uh, that the presence of vaccination, if you assume uh, simulate the impact of vaccination, <coughs> this uh, degree of, of correlation decreased significantly, but it still was very, very significant. And this reflects the fact that, well, there could be even the most popular person, if they're vaccinated, they're likely to escape, not certain, but likely to escape infection. So what we saw, and it was underreported in the literature, was the tremendous importance of understanding the micro details of contact, how long people spend around each other. This was not something that was given quite as much uh, emphasis on many studies, which focused instead on diversity. And given the actual patterns of behavior within the human population, the tremendous diversity we see in amounts of time people spend together, it seemed to us a, a really um, worthy uh, thing to note. Okay, I'm going to be going on now to the second vignette, which is going to be talking about the prospects for self-correcting models. The first vignette made use of an agent-based model. Um, and the second vignette is going to make use of a supernormal agent model. Uh, in this case, um, we're going to pause for a moment to, to again reflect on trade-offs between ongoing measurements, whether through sensors or other, other, um, uh, other sources of information, and, and models. Ongoing measurements. Um, sensor-based or, or through you know, epidemiological surveillance, through screening, can provide great insight through glimpses of recent situation, um, can give you confidence you've understood recent trends. The problem is that they're, they're uh, beset by delays. They, they can be noisy, uncertain. There can be a lot of sampling error associated with surveys, for example, et cetera. And um, they have unclear implications by themselves in and of themselves for decision making. We kind of alluded to that with sensor data. This is a more broad statement I'm making. Dynamic models, on the other hand, are approximations, but some of them are very useful for short-term anticipation of if we make this investment, this sort of um, inter put together this intervention, what may happen going forward, given some assumptions about exogenous factors. They allow us to interpret the current underlying situation, whether measurable or not. They allow us to hypothesize about what might be driving these factors, some of which would be factors we observe, some of which might be observable, and, and other factors might not be in the model. And uh, they allow us to understand the consequences of choices. So given a dynamic hypothesis of how the system works that we're simulating, as captured through a simulation model, we can simulate the effects of different choices within that and get some understanding of to how our choices impact the underlying situation. But absent correction, absent grounding in observations, even the most detailed models uh, tend to eventually uh, divert. So what we're seeking here is closed loop models. Models that continually reincorporate new data as it becomes available to correct their understanding of what's going on there in the outside world. To reestimate the parameters, to reestimate the current state of the system that's out there, essentially to adjust their understanding of what's really the case out there so that you can plan forward with, more, with greater confidence. And bringing these two together has some direct <coughs> benefits that are offered to both data, particularly linking up data to uh, decision making, interpreting areas of the situation that are not directly measured, and to models by keeping models grounded to prevent this sort of divergence over time, to maintain model freshness by repeatedly regrounding it, as it were, recalibrating it in the current, uh, the current situation. 
So the technique we use for this is, is one based on the common folder. And the gentleman you see on the right here is not the 43rd president of the United States. <laughs> it's uh, instead uh, Rudolf Kallman, um, who has made great contributions to this world um, in terms of uh, sensor data and incorporating them with models. And what we'll see here is that um, the Kallman filter is a technique that involves some amount of simulation forward, it's all time updates, <coughs> but it's tracing forward, and then correct based on observations, based on measurements as they occur. Now this technique has been in use since the 1960s in various forms, so the elaborations of it took a little bit longer to come out, and it's routinely applied in things like uh, navigation for an airline, for example. If you're flying along, you have some estimate based on an understanding of the engine thrust and of the altitude and the, the, uh, the air pressure, um, the density of that air. Um, you have some sense as to kind of where you should be in 30 seconds. So you measure forward, go forward 30 seconds, and you have perhaps some data from GPS that helps you position yourself. But that data, just like the model of, of the airplane's engines, is faulty. For example, the model of where you should be might, uh, based on engine thrust and so on, might not have taken into account the vagaries of wind patterns or of uh, the presence of rainfall has only a, a limited understanding of the factors that might influence where you are. And, and the data from the GPS is, as we saw earlier, has a lot of uncertainties associated with it. And so within the common filter, we bring those sources of data together and we blend them. We give greater credence, give greater weight to the one that we believe has greater reliability under the given context. And this reliability may shift. So we give some cases greater reliability, we uh, impute greater reliability for the measurement, and in other cases we do so for the model estimate from earlier, its, its understanding of where we should be at now. And we blend them together using what's called a gain matrix, and we get out uh, a best estimate for the current situation. Now this is all based on some mathematics that I most certainly have no intention of, of subjecting you to. Um, but it is an approach that we can apply quite readily with health models, but it's which has been significantly underapplied. We're looking to remedy that. Um, the particular application that we're undergoing helps alert us to, um, or it helps alert us here as an audience, to a general technique which I believe has tremendous opportunities associated with it when it comes to use of these models. And I'm going to emphasize this as well because it complements what we'll be talking about here in terms of the general idea of, of regular updates. And that is, we're going to evaluate the efficacy of this technique using synthetic population. What I mean by that is, um, we have an analytic approach, the Kalman filter, which we like to use to evaluate how effective it is for our studies. And one of the ways we can do that is by trying to use it with real world data. So we can take a model, say our model of TB, one of our models of TB, or perhaps it's a model of, um, of diabetes. And we can use the Kalman filter to, uh, on an ongoing basis, uh, reconcile the model's prediction of where we should be at by 2012 with data received. But the problem is we don't have direct understanding of what the underlying ground truth is. So we may get an estimate out, but what do we compare it with? Uh, how, can we, how can we be confident that this is any better than the measurement, for example, that was received um, based on surveys or what have you, or based on administrative data. So if we want to evaluate an analytic approach like the common filter, one of the ways we can do that is by creating a simulation model that captures a synthetic population and collects the sort of data that we would collect in the external world. So we're setting up a sort of virtual study. So we establish a simulation model that captures, say, uh, people's risk for diabetes in a, in a reasonably rich model. We perform the simulation using that study, and that simulation captures the, the sort of uh, underlying situation over time within that model. But we blind ourselves as researchers to this. Instead, we collect data from this synthetic population over time, similar to what we would actually have recourse to in the external world, not looking at all the data, but just that the that's similar to what we can get in the external world. And we use our analytic approaches to, to simulate 
uh, to, to analyze that. And then we compare the findings from the analysis procedure to the underlying groundings in the simulation model. So we're simulating, say, the evolution of, of uh, diabetes within the Saskatchewan population. And the model is sort of ground truth here. It, it actually recognizes how many people are actually of diabetes. But we actually simulate, given the sort of data that we can actually measure in the real world, data from only diagnosed diabetics, et cetera, we get some of that data. We apply our estimate, our analysis procedures to that data. Then we compare them to the actual true number of, say, of diabetics that are in that, in that synthetic population. We compare it to sort of this synthetic ground truth that's in the, the underlying model. Now, this approach can be used for a wide variety of, of different types of studies. It can be used to evaluate study designs, analytic approaches, biostatistical measures that try to work in epidemiological data. And it's a very powerful mechanism. Well, in this case, we are using this to evaluate the common question. So we're going to create, we created an agent-based model um, using, driven by sensor data, which produces sort of simulated measured data, the sort of data we might be able to measure um, from the experiment ultimately. And we take a very aggregate model on which we can apply the common filter and we update it. And we see basically how well this very aggregate model, very, very crude model, matches what's actually going on in this agent-based population, okay? So here's the underlying transmission model, the model we saw from FluNet earlier. And we have a very simple, a great simplification of that. This is a system dynamics model for those who recognize it. Susceptible infectives recovered. This is a much simplified version of that. How so? Well, we, we introduce a number of contacts per day that we just estimate a certain mean number of contacts per day across the population, but they're systematically in error. We deliberately introduce a sort of an inaccuracy here. Um, it reflects, in fact, these things can be hard to measure in the external population. We, we make the very simplified assumption that when people get infected to this state, that they're immediately infective, which is a simplification. One that's, that's fairly commonly made. And finally, we make a simplified assumption of random mixing. The people in the population mix more or less um, homogeneously with each other. We don't separate people according to some people have lots of contacts and others have few contacts. And if we have this open loop model, and I apologize for the crudeness of this, what you can see is that um, the system output, the actual output from the, uh, the agent-based model is uh, the underlying unfiltered, the unassisted model like this. And what you could see is it overestimates very significantly the spread of H1N1 and then, um, and then it's declining over time. But what we can do here is we can employ this closed loop modeling strategy. Go from an open loop modeling to incorporate data periodically. Here we, we have four days uh, between times where we incorporate this data. And here this overshoot of the is actually less, uh, less pronounced than in the original. The original, we have this very high peak. Here, it's, it's grounded. If we do it every other day, what we get is a situation where the system dynamics model has a very brief peak, but it's, it's much closer. The blue and the red are much closer. And finally, if we do daily measurements, we find that they're basically indistinguishable. So um, what we've done is through measurement, we've taken a model like this, periodically re-corrected it to the data in the most direct way possible, not even adjusting parameter values, which are actually open for us to adjust if we really wanted to. And we can get a situation where the, the aggregate model matches very, very well the actual observed data, perhaps better than even the most tailored model would match given the vagaries of chance that are involved in the agent-based model. Now, of course, if we arrive at the sort of aggregate model, well, what use is that? is that? What more use than the measured data? Well, we can do projections for this system. We can, after the course of a measurement, reconciling that data, arriving at best consensus estimate for where we're at right now, we can look forward. And uh, time is running short, so I don't have time to go into it. But suffice it to say that the more frequent we measure things, 
we can very quickly arrive at a situation where our measurements permit uh, projection forward that's quite accurate compared to the underlying data. So even a very, very simple model formulated um, in a, uh, a quite uh, stylized fashion can, together with measurement data, yield results comparable to what you would get for an open loop model of vastly, vastly larger complexity and vastly, vastly larger time to build. Why am I applying this to an aggregate model? Well, it's frequently the data that we have only is available in a, in a form that would support doing this sort of work for analytic reasons for aggregate models. Ubiquitous sensing does raise the intriguing potential for inferring state at the individual level. But for the most part, we're stuck with doing it at the aggregate level and Having a model, very importantly, that has a formal mathematical basis underlying it, as we have with system dynamics, is absolutely key for applying those horrendous equations that I hid from you earlier. So um, uh, what I haven't shown here is the full potentialist method with updating parameter values. All I was doing is updating the state, updating estimates of non-observable states, for example, et cetera. So I've talked about two vignettes, and I'm going to finish up with the third and then close with some remarks. So the third relates to use of social network analysis together with models. And we've talked about how with Flunet, we were able to use sense data, that sort of um, punctuated data we saw earlier, aggregated here into the form of the social network, to allow us to uh, depict either a static aggregate network or a very dynamic um, um, network uh, that gets at its uh, finest level of resolution, say 30 seconds for Flunet. Flunet. One of the things we can do with a model like this and that we've explored is using them as a basis for inferential models. So we can use um, an understanding of, of the sort of understanding of how infections spread from person to person that we would capture in a dynamic model, such as an agent-based model or a system dynamics model, to express um, probability distributions uh, for the chance, say, that in the presence of an infective, a given susceptible remains uninfected for a certain length of time. And these formulations can then be used to estimate the likelihood <coughs> that something has indeed occurred given the data we have about the model. For example, who infected whom? Sort of a game of who done it, a game of clue as it were. Who did it, with what instrument and what room? We can get a sense of that from, from this data that we have access to. So, if we have social network uh, data available, and we have some records, say, of people's presentation times when they first reported symptoms, we can infer back from that who might be infected who. If we have data from a long-term care facility with sensors based on patients' gurneys and patients', uh, patients wheelchairs uh, carried by nursing staff, carried by doctors, and we're looking for the source of a nosocomial infection, how MRSA, uh, for example, is spreading that facility, or how Clostridium difficile uh, infected people. We could try to identify infection pathways using these inferencing techniques. Identify infection pathways that not only involve individuals like that, nurses, doctors, uh, patients, uh, physiotherapists, et cetera, but also places, things like surfaces, a dining room surface, pieces of equipment, et cetera. So um, in order to help validate this approach, we made use again of that um, synthetic uh, population approach. So we created a custom disease simulation model. It was very, very detailed. And that gave us some simulated epidemiological data, the sort of data that we would plausibly have from, say, a sensor-based study, or data that we would plausibly have from uh, recording manually through contact tracing. And then what we did is uh, we took that data and we, provide, we simulated an inference, uh, used inferencing on it to try to identify who infected who. And we compared that then with blinded data from the actual simulation model on really who infected who. So for example, if we had data like this, and this is a very simplified case, um, obviously, but uh, for the sake of didactics, if we had this set of, of uh, six people, and um, each of the people was associated with a, a time that they were diagnosed um, as, as uh, symptoms um, that information is not itself sufficient to let us know who infected who because some people might have taken longer to develop the, the symptoms. There might be asymptomatic periods. Um, for many reasons, uh, 
we can't simply read out when the infection cons were from the times the symptoms appeared. So what we can do here is we can create hypotheses for how the infection might have spread, perhaps from E to F to C and from C radially to each of these parties. And then we can turn this into a mathematical expression. This is based on what's called Bayesian inferencing, um, and I don't have time to go into it, but um, there's a, a systematic procedure for going from a, a network to these sort of data. We can then evaluate the likelihood of that particular pathway of spread to arrive at, a, at an estimate. And what we've shown is that our algorithms can be often be pretty good with simple networks. We've evaluated them um, using data from, um, from uh, many uh, simulated studies. And what we found is that for certain ranges of plausible illnesses, these types of approaches can be quite diagnostic. Diagnostic for helping us understand um, who infected who, from who the, in the uh, infection first spread, for example, who was likely to have gotten infected during what period of time. And this can provide uh, a basis for then going and looking to uh, identify uh, surfaces that may be involved in spreading the infection, individuals who may be undiagnosed yet, but may be involved in spreading it, et cetera. So this is an inferencing technique, again, that can leverage sensor data in the sense that sensors allow us to reconstruct these networks. And these networks can either be static, such as that shown here, or dynamic, such as will be constructed frequently, most directly from sense data, and can allow us to, to infer um, people at, uh, who, who might have been contributing or places who might have been contributing to uh, the spread of infection. So I've talked about three vignettes, vignettes that each demonstrate a different facet of how sensor data, data from these ubiquitous, portable, wireless sensors, can be combined with each of the types of modeling covered here and others to date to provide different types of insights um, of, that are germane to, to our health challenges. So uh, just a few concluding remarks, and I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, the first is, Sensors are increasingly ubiquitous. Uh, these commodity devices, not custom-built, lab-built devices, but devices to be bought in the open market, can serve a dual-purpose as virtual sensor platforms without losing their original functionality. Diverse communication signals allow us to repurpose them for locationing, for detection of proximity, et cetera. And coupled with models, sensor data can offer significant and complementary health insights. None of those inferences that I talked about could have been done without models. And the models would have been greatly handicapped without the sort of sensor data that we're discussing uh, here. And each system science modeling type, whether it's agent-based system dynamics or social network analysis, could support compelling and often unique insights when coupled in this way with sensor data. Data that can't be, or uh, value that can't be delivered directly by the other techniques. So I'd like to thank you for your patience. I know it's been a whirlwind tour. Um, and I'd like to open the floor up for questions.